everyone it's time for another sensory analysis uh, video lecture and in this one we are going to be talking about concepts for threshold testing threshold testing is extremely useful for food product developers to identify at what concentration of an ingredient the population is able to tell the difference so do take some time to make sure you've reviewed the difference testing videos that we've done before to make sure that you've got that down pat before jumping into this video because this is going to be an extension of that same skill set and start to apply it in more complex forms so at the end of this video you'll be able to discuss when threshold testing is used by product developers as a means of evaluating if a product is the same or different from a benchmark sample and at what concentration it is deemed different within that population. You use a basic triangle test method for evaluating difference and then evaluating threshold in food products. We'll define the correct hypothesis testing for threshold testing and we'll know what's re required for a basic threshold sensory setup, including the tray setup, labeling, and questionnaire scorecard. And when I say questionnaire scorecard, I mean a lot of questionnaire scorecards. It's the same, but we're going to have dozens, possibly hundreds of scorecards that we need to generate. We're going to read those scorecards and interpret the individual results and then perform a best estimate threshold mean calculation on those individual results across the population. We'll, and we'll also create a histogram using software to interpret the cumulative population scores. What does this all mean? Well, what it really means is we're thinking about at what concentration will a population define a product as different from one another? And so one example I often use when I'm teaching this class in person is we'll imagine we're a popcorn factory. And so many companies want to reduce sodium in their food products, but maybe you've got the top selling microwave popcorn out there. Meanwhile, the sodium value is too high. How do we go about gradually reducing that sodium level so that our consumers aren't going to notice the difference between our flagship product and the new formulation? That's a good example of a threshold test. We're going to test different concentrations within that population until we can find out where they're starting to taste the difference and then start to make some recommendations based off of our intelligence from that to identify what's the appropriate concentration to launch that product at. So what's our hypothesis? Now, when I just gave that example, I said we started with the um, full sodium salt and then we decreased. What we're, what we're actually doing is an ascending concentration gradient where we go from the least amount of change to the most amount of change stepwise using difference testing. And what we want to see within our population is do the population uh, define this product as the same or do they define it as different? You'll remember from our difference testing video that was the hypothesis from difference testing. In essence, we're taking difference testing and adding a second dimension, which is concentration. We usually use 20 to 50 panelists, but then we're repeating this over, over multiple concentrations. We do those same screening techniques where we're looking for their uh, panelists' ability to differentiate. We want to make sure they don't have a cold or allergies. Um, we do use tables to help identify when the population is telling the difference, but there's a, a few different analyses. It's sort of simple, but we're adding complexity because we do have to have that concentration in there. And it won't tell us how much people like things. It won't tell us at what percent of the population we're going to start to alienate people. So again, um, maybe we're the largest popcorn company in the country and maybe we've got a really solid marketplace. If we start tinkering with the product, how much of our population are we willing to alienate as we're tinkering, uh, tinkering away with that product formulation? I can't tell you that and this test won't tell you that it will give you some really interesting intel though to help you define where your populations are telling a difference. 
Now you're likely saying, hey, you're cheating, you're using the same slide. Well, in many respects, these slides are the same. Where, where are food scientists going to use this technique? Well, if we're changing the concentration of a technical ingredient. I actually have that Coke can up there for a reason, because uh, a couple years ago in North America, uh, the Coca-Cola Corporation went about taking the classic Coca-Cola and using, I am 100% confident they would have used this technique, they would have, uh, they shaved off a few percent of the sugar concentration in the Coca-Cola. And you can just imagine how much of a cost savings that would be for Coca-Cola. If they're making millions of units and they're shaving off, let's say 5% of the sugar concentration, that's 5% less sugar that they're buying. And if you're buying millions of units, that's millions of grams of sugar that they're not buying anymore. It's a benefit for the customer because they're not having as much sugar in their product. And it's a benefit for Coca-Cola as a cost savings. Same with salt. Uh, so many companies are out there reducing sodium in their products. And um, it's a chance for them to go about reducing the sodium while still retaining the same functionality in that product. Often it's used for least cost formulation as well. So let's say, let's say I was making macaroni and cheese and I could buy the top premium flour for making my noodles or I could buy discount flour for making my noodles. Maybe the best bet is to do a blend ratio so that let's see what the functionality is on the, on the best top ingredient for making my noodles and then reduce on this, on this discount brand of macaroni and cheese, slowly reduce the amount of the premium flour with and replace that with a discount flour so that we still have the same functionality in that noodle and the customer is not going to taste the difference, but we're reducing the cost so that the consumer gets a nice discount product. This is what's called least cost formulation and food product developers are often involved in that sort of uh, proceedings. So again, just like difference testing, we're really only asking the key question, are the samples the same or are they different? But what we're doing is we're going to be asking this question repeatedly. So if you remember from my difference test slides, we had the three samples and then we had the sample that was different and our, and our uh, panelists were requested to ask which was the same and which one was different. Please identify the different sample. Well, in this case, we're starting with a product that has a really low amount of change within that product. And then we're going to do a second panel but we're going to increase. So uh, within my schematic here, I'm just representing that by increasing the size of those little blue dots. That little blue dot could be representing a technical ingredient like a stabilizer in my ice cream, or it could be sugar reduction in my ice cream. It could be fat reduction in my ice cream. It really doesn't matter. Also too, I should be randomizing the order, but I'm not going to because I think you're smarter than that and you can figure this out. But Imagine now, oh, now we've got our third test and now the, in, uh, the concentration's increased even further. Oh, and now we've got a fourth test, concentration even further. And we are now thinking in multiple dimensions within this test to figure out at what of those concentrations has our population hit that tipping point against which we are uh, no longer confident that this product is the same. Oh, it keeps going. <laughs> in theory, uh, most uh, most threshold tests have somewhere in the range of uh, four or five concentrations, but it really depends on the uh, level of specification and specificity that you need for your test. If you were, let's say, Coca-Cola and doing a multi-million dollar product launch, you'd want to be very, 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 very confident within your data. And so you may have even more data points and larger populations that you're testing against. Whereas if you are a small mom and pop company and don't have a huge budget, you may set up one of these gradients and it might just be your own R&D team or your own, it could be the owner of the company and you for all that it really matters. There are, there are accredited methods with ASTM. Um, 
But I'm going to show you the fundamentals behind this method and encourage people who really need that scientific rigor to go out and get the ASTM method and follow it. So just a quick reminder, we are doing a discrimination test. This is where we have those two products different and one is this, uh, or two are the same and one is different, pardon me. And the null hypothesis is the samples are the same and the alternative is the samples are different. We're doing a triangle test, but we're doing triangle test layered one on top of another so that we see which sample is the most different. So in this case, hope, uh, at some point, people will say, oh, it's the sample. Just a reminder, we're using three-digit codes to uh, label our samples because it gives the least amount of um, influence. And we're also using some sort of um, behind-the-scenes set list so that not everyone's always getting the odd sample as the third sample. They very well could be getting it in the first... Uh, sample on the left or sometimes the sample in the middle and sometimes it will be two B's and one A. We want to make sure that we have an appropriate level of randomization within our samples so that not every tray and not every panelist is getting the same. There have been plenty of times where I've run panels and someone will whisper it's the middle sample and you don't want to do that. You want to make sure that people are doing it on the merits of the product and not because they're quote-unquote cheating, not that there's such a thing as cheating. What's also important is that you take some time to set up an appropriate gradient. So for example, when we do this in class, we found that um, we were using approximately two grams of table salt per 100 grams of popped, air popped popcorn. And then we would reduce the sodium, and this is what we would call an arithmetic gradient. And the gradient went from two grams of table salt to, in this case, it would be 75% of the original table salt, 50% of the original table salt, and we substituted potassium chloride in. We had 25% uh, and then down to 0%. Uh, that would be an uh, arithmetic gradient. Sometimes uh, people will use a geometric gradient and that's where they're multiplying the concentration, so maybe you start with one part per million, two parts per million, four parts per million, eight, 16, and so on. It, it, I, I am a, um, my sensory analysis pract uh, practice really comes from working with small business, and I try and make the tools accessible to small businesses and not overdwell on the semantics and the, uh, pedagogy behind it. Again, if you really need a high level of semantics behind your testing, I highly recommend getting the ASTM protocol and following that. But the fundamentals that I'm teaching here are going to follow through with this. So we're going to set up that gradient. And again, these gradients need to be respective to the appropriate benchmark concentration that you're working from and then change off percent wise or change off um, using some sort of geogra or geometric multiplier to change the concentration, whether that's um, elimination or increasing or substitution. We've got this example questionnaire, and this is the same example questionnaire that we uh, would be using if we were doing difference testing. Now that said, um, we have to think that we've got an example questionnaire for the first concentration, an example questionnaire for for the second concentration, for the third concentration. And so you, you have to have new numerical randomizations for each of those as well. Again, um, so many people who are doing sensory analysis are now putting these questionnaires up on apps and using things like SurveyMonkey or Google Forms or paying out for some of the more complex sensory analysis software like uh, CompuSense and building the questionnaires as an online app and then presenting the questionnaire on a tablet or on a laptop computer or sometimes even uh, accessible on people's um, smartphones. What people are going to do is then place the X in the, in the box where they feel the sample is different. What's the tray going to look like? Well, here's our example tray from before and 
in this case, it just happens to be orange juice, but uh, we had the three samples and we've got the placemat down below with the codes on it as well. We have the questionnaire and in this case we did a paper-based questionnaire, but again, there's nothing wrong with having a placemat and then having an electronic questionnaire. We have a, a small cup of water to cleanse people's palates and some unsalted uh, saltine crackers for cleansing the palate. Again, what's the appropriate palate cleanser? It depends on what your product is. In this case, with the acidic uh, orange juice saltine crackers was the appropriate palate cleanser. But in some cases, if you were doing saltine crackers, for example, having saltine crackers as your palate cleanser would not be appropriate. You may just want to have extra water or provide some sort of neutral flavored uh, product to help cleanse people's palates. And in some cases, you don't really need a palate cleanser. You just need some time. Give people some extra water. Give them a five minute break between trays. In this case, in the in the case of the um, threshold testing, we're going to have multiple trays. Now, how do I represent this in my slide deck? Oh, well, let's say here's multi, uh, tray number one. We are starting with our lowest concentration intervention. Oh, and now we're going to get a new tray. And now we've got a new tray. Oh, check this out. I've got little blue dots in my in my sample. That's a schematic representation of changing the concentration on something. So for example, um, let's say orange juice has voluntary um, fortification of calcium. Let's see how much calcium we can add to our orange juice before our uh, population starts to taste a difference in the formulation against the benchmark orange juice. So let's say that was, I don't know, 100 milligrams per liter of calcium in the in the juice. Oh, and now we've got a new tray. And oh, this time the randomization says it's the middle sample that's the different one. And my, my schematic representation shows it's a, a, a higher concentration again. We're starting at the lowest difference to the highest difference in our order. And again, there's a reason behind that. If you start with the highest difference and you go down to the lowest, then people immediately are knowing what is the attribute to be looking for within the sensory. They'll hone in, and maybe in the case of calcium, maybe it's got a metallic or chalky taste. They'll hone in on that and they'll start to recognize that. If you go in the reverse order and start with the biggest change first, and then work your order in the concentration gradient to the least change, they'll be, they'll be um, highlighted for what that difference is. Oh, and a new tray. Oh, and, and, and now we're at the highest concentration. So you can see how the, the length of running this panel could become quite extended because there's quite a lot of samples that you have to prepare. In just for one person, you just saw we had four different trays, each with three samples. So let's say we've got four times three, 12 samples per person. And let's say you've got 20 people participating. 12 times 20, we have 240 samples to prepare. So threshold testing adds a lot of complexity, but the data that you get from it's quite rich. So how many trays, how many samples in that concentration gradient. It's really sample dependent and it depends on the nature and properties of the sample. I always say to sensory analysis folks, um, more often I'm working with product developers and small entrepreneurs doing product development and um, taste your own product before you make a decision. You should have a really, uh, a really fine sense of what is an appropriate gradient to present before you go to sensory analysis. And you may very well have a product that performs well at high concentrations of, of the, of the um, substitution that you're making. The number of samples in that concentration is also going to be dependent on the palate fatigue. So um, if it's something that's really spicy or something that's really sour or very strong in flavor like blue cheese, you may, you may have palate fatigue that comes on very easily. Whereas if you've got a really easygoing, easy to eat sample, then people may be willing to put up with more. You've got to also think how logistically you're going to handle all those samples. In the case of my orange juice that I just had, I could be pre-portioning that orange juice to sample cups 
with a souffle cup lid and placing them on speed racks in a fridge. Whereas if I was doing a carbonated beverage or a hot soup, it may be more difficult logistically to have that and I'd need more staffing and I'd need more time. And so these, these are considerations that you really need to think about when setting up your, your analysis. We've got our example questionnaire. Oh, and someone's filled it out. Hey, they've decided that that was the odd sample. Did they get it right? Oh, based off of our set list, 341 would have been the odd sample. So in this case, they did not identify the difference. And in this case, on this questionnaire from uh, my friend who did the sample, my imaginary friend, <laughs> uh, my imaginary friend got the, they did identify the difference. So that set list that we've created based off of our discussion on the difference testing, that will help us identify where the samples are scoring. Now, I'm going to jump to Excel for the rest of this analysis. And so bear with me here for a moment as I switch recording screens and we will do some data collection and analysis in an Excel file. And we're now in Excel. Fantastic. So let's say we've gone along panelist number one here. My concentrations are not the same as the popcorn ones. These ones are different. I've got concentration. Let's say these are in parts per million. You should put the units of your concentrations up so that whoever's analyzing your data can reverse engineer it. But let's say these are parts per million. We've got one part per million, two parts per million, four parts per million, eight, 16, 32. So as you remember, that's a geometric concentration gradient, not an arithmetic concentration gradient because we're multiplying each one to increase, whereas in arithmetic, we're just adding. So in this case, panelist one, wait a second, we've got all these pluses. A plus I have in my, uh, I often organize the data in this way. Plus meaning that they got, they were able to identify the difference. So in this case, at concentration one, they were able to identify the difference, able to, and wait a second, now they can't. If you remember back in our difference testing, it is possible to guess and guess correctly. What we're really looking for is where is the clear differentiation where they're constantly getting the correct answer. And so yes, indeed, down here, panelist number one guessed correctly, but then they didn't get it correctly at a higher concentration. And, and, and realistically, they should be consistently getting it as we're increasing concentration. So the real differentiator is here between uh, concentration four and five, so eight parts per million and 16 parts per million. That's the real break between these two. So first, excuse me, first thing what I'm going to do is go along. I like to color code it. It just makes it visually pop. But I've gone along and identified at, this was sensory panel number one in this highlighted box. And at this point, we've only got two respondents, but they're really actually guessing. Here we've got three respondents, but it's most likely that two out of the three respondents are actually guessing. Now we've got um, at constant, uh, sensory panel number three. Now we've got one, two, three, four, five people with the right response. But in this case, it's likely that only three out of those five are truly identifying the difference. And bit by bit, we're increasing. So at concentration four, we're now up to, it's likely five out of five people at this point are consistently telling the difference. Oh, and at this concentration, now we've only got one person who can't tell the difference. And at these later ones, everyone is consistently detecting the difference. Now, how do we interpret this? Well, one method is called the best estimate threshold. And this is where we're taking the logarithmic mean of these populations. So first thing that we need to do is figure out what their logarithmic mean 
um, break-even point is. So we're taking the space between where they can't tell the difference down here and the space between where they can tell the difference. And what we want is the logarithmic mean, not just the, the straight up mean between eight and 16, but the logarithmic mean. So how do we do that? I've be, the color helps me visually differentiate where I need to make that cutoff. So I need the log of the F7 concentration plus the log of the G7 concentration. So log eight plus log 16 add those two together and divide by two. That is going to be my logarithmic best estimate threshold on that individual panelist. And then if I reverse log it, so take that value and multiply it um, um, reverse log, then I'm going to get out their individual bet score. Now, if we, if we just did the straight up mean eight, 16, uh, add the two together and it's 24 and divide that in two, it's 12. This uh, geometric mean is not quite the same, but because it's a geometric progression, this is how we would be representing it. So I've gone along and done the same for each of these different individuals. So in this case, we're looking at the sum of G, uh, the G7 concentration and the G8 concentration. So this one and this one is the cutoff the sum of that divide by two, and then reverse log it. How about this one? Now we're looking at E, uh, the, uh, the sum of the log of E7 and F7. So log E7 plus log F7, divide by two, and then reverse log it. I'm gonna do that for each and every individual cutoff point, and then we can take the sum of it and reverse log the sum of that to get the best estimate of the threshold of the population. So in essence, this is the concentration at which it's a 50-50 split in our population. 50% of the population, we really take a look at this, what does this mean? It's somewhere in this zone, 6.5. 498, so somewhere in this zone, and just visually representing it with the color, we can see that that indeed is where we're seeing that cutoff. Now, we have to think th really about the theory behind this. Do, do I want to make my concentration that? This really gives us a lot of information about the population dynamics, but as a product formulator, I may not be wanting to have 50% of my population say, I can taste a difference. And so we may be interested in doing a second analysis on this data. And again, I have 10 data points here just to represent this, but typical participation is gonna be 20 to 50 participants in this, in this sort of panel. So this 50-50 cutoff is, it's interesting and it is a very important theoretical value but we also may want to do a histogram and a cumulative histogram so that we can visualize where do these population changes happen. So the first thing I need to do if I'm, I, if I'm gonna do a histogram, I do have a whole video on just creating histograms in Excel, but uh, let's, start with, let's uh, start with a really rapid uh, attack here. So first thing I need to do is set my bins. A histogram requires, it's sort of, it looks like a bar chart and we need to define what each of those bars is going to be. So each of these bars, pardon me, but I took a shortcut and I did do the actual mean between these two. So the first bin, I need to know which data sets are cutting off here. So I figured out one plus two divided by two and that's that bin. Then the next one, two plus four divided by two is giving me three. Four plus eight gives me 12 divide by two is six, and so on. That would help me figure out where these bins are going to fall within this histogram. Now, in Excel, to be able to do a histogram, you need to turn on the data analysis tools. And in my histogram video, if you're not sure about how to do that, watch the histogram video on my YouTube channel, and that will instruct you with more detail. 
We're going to go into the data analysis tool pack and in there we've got a lovely tool called the histogram. Fantastic. I'm going to click OK. My input range in this case is going to be the individual bet scores for each of those panelists. And my bin range I just predefined is going to be each one of these uh, more or less is the mean point between those two blocks there. I'm going to set my output range, but what I really want here is a cumulative percentage and a chart. The chart's going to help me visualize the data, and the cumulative percentage is going to give me a running tally showing me percent-wise where we are going within this population. I'm going to click an output range, so I think I set it over here. You can see I already checked to make sure I could do this. <laughs> and click OK, and boom. This is how easy it is. So let's just get that off of there. The histogram is going to give us a sense of where in this population we are hitting these different population percents. And so if you were a product developer, you may be saying, you know what, I'm not willing to go with this this bet score as my cutoff and my sweet sweet spot, if I can use that term. It's a funny term to use in sensory. But uh, maybe I want to know where where in my population are we okay with 20% of the population? If we're okay with 20% of the population being able to tell the difference, then this cumulative chart is going to say, hmm, it's somewhere in this so somewhere in this range, go across from 20%. And down, so maybe around like two parts per million in this, in the case of this concentration. If we're, it, it, we'll have to think about from a marketing perspective, how much of the population are we willing to allow to taste or sense a difference in these products? And the histogram gives you a different perspective on the data. And again, are there more robust means of doing this analysis? Absolutely. But for small businesses without a lot of specialist food scientists, this is a really, a really rapid method to be able to identify where that appropriate cutoff is for doing the sweet spot. Again, <laughs> I say that with a, with a, a chuckle, but to figure out where the really, uh, important part of, uh, setting that concentration. You may find that um, once you've got these histograms in place that you need to go and reanalyze some data with, uh, with a finer tooth comb. I've seen it where people have set up these concentration gradients and people can taste the difference and the, the data is more or less solid. We can taste the difference. You may find a lot of richness once you've run a sample once or twice and got a better sense of how this runs. I am sharing these files with uh, some of the groups that I work with. Uh, people who I'm teaching this class to at Niagara College will have this file that they can reverse engineer in their Blackboard and some of the other groups like SciCan, um, I have shared this in the shared drive. I'm really excited that you've taken the time to get to this point in the presentation. I am really going to encourage you to try it out. Um, pick some easy samples. Um, as I mentioned in class, we often use popcorn as an example because popcorn is cheap and we just do substitutes, substitutions with table salt versus potassium chloride. That's a really simple example to work out. Um, but it's it does take some logistics to think through all of the steps to do the sensory analysis. But again, the more you practice the logistics behind it and the preparation, the, the better and easier it's going to become. I encourage you to try it out and I love getting questions from you through the YouTube channel and through all the different um, platforms that I share my videos on. Take care, have tons of fun trying this out.